Um, so I just want to thank people for tuning in to the USGS Landslide Hazard Seminar. This meeting is hosted by the Landslide Hazards Program and co-organized with contributions from Stephen Slaughter and Jamie Kostelnik. And for those of you that um, are new to this meeting, you have the ability to submit questions via the chat window or to use the raise your hand feature in combination with your microphone and video camera. We're going to wait until the end of today's presentation to take questions. And so in the meantime, please just do your best to make sure your microphone is muted uh, when you're not intending to speak. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, James Malk. Uh, James grew up in Western Colorado, and he has a BS in Earth Sciences from Montana State University and an MS uh, at Utah State University. His thesis focused on understanding uh, the geomorphic signatures of quaternary salt dissolution subsidence and river incision around Moab, Utah. And he's been working at the uh, Wyoming State Geological Survey since 2019. Uh, he has a specialty uh, there in uh, geologic hazards mapping and geomorphology. And his current projects include surficial geologic mapping of the Ramshorn quad, uh, Quadrangle and a landslide susceptibility study for Southern Teton County, as well as a quaternary fault trace mapping uh, effort uh, based on LIDAR data. So it sounds like a, a lot of work uh, that you're spread across there, James. Thank you for taking the, the time to present uh, the kind of more landslide parts of your work. All right, great. Um, well, thank you for that introduction, Matt. I appreciate it and uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to speak in front of uh, this group today. So thanks everyone for tuning in. Um, so in keeping with uh, kind of the theme of, of talks you've probably heard from other state geological surveys, uh, this is really going to be an overview talk of uh, some of the work that we do in Wyoming, um, some of the products that we've produced, as well as some of the uh, landslide, landslide related issues that we deal with um, in the state. So a quick roadmap of the talk, um, I'm going to go over some background about Wyoming um, and about our agency, the Wyoming State Geological Survey. I'll also talk about our work, um, work that we've completed in the past, um, some projects that we're working on now, and um, what our plan is going forward into the future. I'll also cover some of the uh, challenges that we face uh, here in Wyoming uh, with landslide hazards. And then finally, I'll go over some um, uh, noteworthy landslides just as, as case studies for, for what's going on in, in the state. And um, just for reference, this photo here, this is of the lavender slide in the Grovant River Valley in western Wyoming. Um, I, I put it on the, the title slide because it's a beautiful area. And also, I'll be talking quite a bit about this area um, in the latter half of the talk. So a little bit of background about the WSGS. We are an independent state agency and our mission is, is two-pronged. Um, we're tasked with promoting the beneficial and responsible development of Wyoming's mineral and energy resources, as well as understanding, uh, characterizing and informing the public about geologic hazards. And so we are non-regulatory. Um, so that means uh, we primarily work to study and disseminate information about Wyoming's geology uh, for the benefit of Wyoming citizens. So we don't have any uh, regulatory authority or mandate. Um, we have 17 staff members. So we're a relatively small agency and uh, two of us work primarily in geologic hazards. And so that's, that's me um, and my boss, Seth Whitkey, who, who I believe is on the, the call today as well. And all of the products that I'm gonna talk about um, in this presentation, you can find on our website, which is wsgs.wio.gov. This is just a screenshot of the homepage. Um, so if you're interested um, in learning more about some of these products, this is kind of the, the place to go. Um, and as well, I'm, I'm happy to, to field any questions or if you have anything that comes up after the presentation, feel free to get in touch with me and, and I'll uh, point you in the right direction. So this is uh, just a shaded relief map of Wyoming, um, just to give a, a, a general geologic and geographic overview of the state. These black lines here are, I've, I've put in there sort of outlining the various geologic domains that are within our state. Um, and so most of Wyoming resides within the, the Middle Rocky Mountains and the Wyoming Basin physiographic provinces. And that means that um, uh, for most of the state, the, the geography is, is dominated by uh, basins that are separated by broad basement cord anticlinal uplifts. So basins like the Green River Basin here in the southwest corner or the Powder River Basin here in the northeast corner, and then uplifts such as the Wind River Range, um, the Bighorn Mountains, or the Laramie Mountains here. 
in the western third of the state. Um, it's, it's a little more complicated. We have um, the fold and thrust belt here in the far western um, part of the state, which was produced by the severe orogeny. And then we have overprinting by more recent geologic and tectonic events, um, including uh, regional extension um, uh, associated with the basin and range province, as well as Eocene and younger volcanism up here in the Absorcas. And then of course, um, in the far northwest corner, we have um, very recent quaternary volcanism associated with the Yellowstone hotspot. So these uh, bright green polygons that you see on the map here, these are all of the mapped landslides uh, in Wyoming. And a, a few things probably pop out to you at first, um, one of which is that most of the landslides in the state are concentrated in this northwest, in this northwest quadrant in the western mountains. Um, outside of that zone, we tend to see the most landslides on the flanks of the Laramide uplifts. And this, this is because um, along these flanks, we have uh, relatively steeply dipping Fanner, rocks in the Phanerozoic section. Um, so that would be places like the east flank of the Wind River Range, or kind of here around the perimeter of the Bighorn Mountains, or even here in the Black Hills. Um, and so that's kind of the, the, the first order pattern of where we see landslides in Wyoming. And so for this talk, I'm primarily going to be focused on this northwest corner. Um, and that's, again, because this is where most of the landslide activity is. Um, and it, it's also where um, most of my work over the past few years has been concentrated uh, in this region of the state. So the first uh, product um, that we have here at the WSGS that I want to talk about is our statewide landslide inventory. And um, this was really an enormous effort that took place over about 15 years from the uh, late 1980s to the early 2000s. And it was led by Jim Case, who was the manager of the Geologic Hazards Division at the WSGS during that time. And so this, this was a, a statewide inventory um, and it was completed through photogeologic mapping at one to 24,000 scale. And initially this effort um, consisted of um, digitizing and, and redrawing landslides that were already mapped on existing uh, bedrock geologic maps at one to 24,000 scale. Um, but this was, this was a fair, this was sort of fairly limited because um, first of all, the, there's not complete coverage of one to 24,000 scale bedrock geologic mapping across the state. And second of all, uh, Jim Case and his colleagues soon realized that uh, not every landslide uh, that's out on the landscape actually ends up on a bedrock geologic map. There's, there's many more out there um, than what a lot of bedrock mappers will, will put on their products. So um, they kind of went back to the drawing board and, and this inventory actually consists of all original mapping. Um, and it's, it's all um, with an express purpose of, of mapping landslides. And so that's what the, the current landslide inventory consists of, is, is all these original maps through photogeologic interpretation and interpretation of, of stereo photo, photo pairs. Um, so the way they did this is they, um, they actually hand drew these landslides on um, black and white topo sheets. And so that's what I'm showing here. This is a scan of one of these seven and a half minute quadrangles. The, the landslides are kind of shown in this gray color um, with the outlines. And then uh, some interpretation of, of movement directions are, are shown um, schematically with these arrows. And over the course of these 15 years, around 850 seven and a half minute quadrangles were mapped. So it really was a, a, a large effort. Um, and then in addition to the actual line work and mapping, each of the landslide polygons was, was classified um, according to uh, the material involved and the movement type. And the classification that, that Jim Case developed and used and that we still use today is, is modified from Varnes. Um, and so it's, it's kind of shown conceptually here. And, and there's, uh, we, we have this figure on our website as well. Um, and importantly, this classification scheme allows for complex movement types. So uh, mass movements that involve more than one type of material or, or more than um, one type of movement as well. And then later on in the, in the 2000s, there was a large effort to digitize all 
850 of these quadrangles. And, and that was another um, kind of sustained effort to, to transfer all of that kind of hard copy map sheet information into a comprehensive GIS database. And the result of that um, is what we show today on our interactive geologic hazards map. Um, so this is just an ARC online map that can be accessed from our website homepage. And there's kind of a slew of, of various layers related to geologic hazards. Um, this is just a screenshot I've taken uh, showing just the landslides here in green. Um, but that was sort of the next step uh, for this statewide database. And, and it's, it's, it's what we use today. Um, and, uh, you know, from my, from my perspective, this statewide database is, is a really useful uh, product and it has a few strengths, I think. Um, one of the strengths is the fact that it is comprehensive. It covers the, the entire state. There's over 33,000 landslide features digitized here. So if I'm mapping in a, um, you know, a remote area, I can still go to that quadrangle and sure enough, there's, there's landslides that are mapped on there um, from this work. And then another strength is the fact that um, the methods, the scale at which this was mapped, the um, aerial photos and stereo photos that were used to map, um, even the mappers themselves, uh, there's, remarkably, there's remarkable consistency across all of that um, throughout, those 15 year uh, throughout that 15 year effort. Um, so that means that, you know, what's the criteria used to map a landslide you know, here in the western part of the state is the same criteria that was used elsewhere. Um, so the consistency, I think, is a is a big um, benefit and um, strength of this database. Moving forward um, a, a few years, um, more recently, our focus uh, here for landslide work has been on producing landslide susceptibility maps. So these are maps that show um, where there are various combinations of pre-existing conditions that make a landscape more or less predisposed to landsliding. And so um, our, our first effort at this was a statewide one to 500,000 scale landslide susceptibility map. Um, and this was published in 2019, um, just before I uh, started working here at the WSGS. And so this was work that was done by my boss, Seth Whitkey, as well as Jim Stafford, who's a hydrogeologist here at the WSGS. And um, this, this uh, landslide susceptibility map looks only at deep-seated landslides. So it doesn't include things like debris flows or rock falls. Um, and the way that uh, Seth and Jim produced this map was through a GIS algorithm that combined um, rock strength and slope. Um, and so for the, the slope component, the input was a, um, a statewide 30 meter uh, resolution digital elevation model with slope binned into uh, eight classes. And then for rock strength, um, the, the input was um, our, basically our statewide geologic map with uh, 208 uh, unique geologic formations that ended up being binned into three rock strength classes. And so these rock strength and slope rasters were then intersected in a GIS to produce the landslide susceptibility raster where each pixel or cell on that raster is assigned a uh, susceptibility ranking based on this uh, matrix over here on the right. So the, the red colors and the higher numbers represent uh, pixels that have a higher landslide susceptibility. And then the lower numbers uh, with the green and white colors represent pixels that have a lower landslide susceptibility. And for those of you who have, who have done these sort of exercises before, you'll recognize that I'm glossing over a lot of details and the, the, exact, um, <laughs> the exact method by which you bin uh, geologic formations into rock strength classes uh, is, is subject to a lot of debate. Um, and, and you can really go down the rabbit hole with this. And so um, our strategy here was to really make it as, as simple as possible. Again, using only three rock strength classes the the kind of the the class one for the strongest rocks consisted of crystalline rocks and well cemented sandstones class two for those intermediate strength rocks consisted of weakly cemented sandstones and then class three for the weakest rocks consisted of uh, shales claystones unconsolidated deposits uh, and and previously mapped landslides and so this is the product this is just a screenshot of that um, statewide landslide susceptibility map 
Again, the red colors show areas with higher susceptibility and the greens and whites show areas with lower susceptibility. And so this uh, raster and this map has a pixel size of 60 meters. Um, so that means it's a, it's a good kind of statewide general data set, but it certainly doesn't replace uh, a site-specific geotechnical study uh, if you're, for instance, a landowner um, wanting to know about landslide hazard on your property. Um, and so currently we're, we're working on taking this kind of statewide one to 500,000 scale landslide susceptibility map. And we're, we're trying to build on that by zooming in and creating larger scale or more detailed landslide susceptibility maps. Um, and so this is a project that I'm currently working on. It's, it's still in development. We're kind of, we're, we're working out the methods still. Um, but the test case um, that, that I'm using for this is the Southern half of Teton County. And so Teton County is in the far uh, western part of, of the state, uh, right along the Idaho border. It includes uh, Grand Teton National Park, uh, the town of Jackson, if you've ever visited that area. And the reason we're focusing on Teton County to start is that, um, first of all, we have recent and updated landslide mapping in the area um, that's informed by some recently released uh, LIDAR data. Um, and that mapping that we've completed over the last few years. There's also a remarkably great um, 1 to 24,000 scale um, bedrock geologic map coverage um, in the Grand Teton National Park in Jackson Hole area, um, thanks to the many decades of, of mapping of, of folks um, like Dave Love uh, and others who, who worked there. And then finally, there's, there's really an acute need in this part of the state for landslide susceptibility mapping. Um, it's an area with generally high uh, landslide susceptibility, um, and that's intersected with um, development pressures and high economic value to create kind of a, a high risk situation. And as I'll talk about um, a little bit later, there is a history of, of damaging landslides and economically significant landslides in this part of the state. So again, this is, this is in development. We're, um, we're planning to, for the GIS algorithm, incorporate slope and rock strength uh, once again, as well as um, existing maps, landslides. And we're looking at um, potentially incorporating some other factors as well. So um, some of the talks in this series have actually have, have been quite helpful for us when we're thinking about the, um, the methods for this. So, so stay tuned. And then in the future, um, we're where we plan to go with our landslide program um, at the WSGS, um, we would like to expand these larger scale landslide susceptibility maps um, beyond Teton County to other uh, counties in the state, either, either kind of breaking those maps out by county or by individual 30 by 60 minute quadrangle. And then another effort that will be sort of an ongoing project is updating our statewide landslide database with um, landslide mapping that's informed by LIDAR data. So currently we have LIDAR coverage for about 70% of the state. And um, some of the, the other uh, quadrangle scale maps that, that I've been working on, we've, um, we've been sort of um, piecemeal updating our um, landslide, our digital landslide database with, with the landslide mapping from those quadrangles. So um, this is a, a a LIDAR slope shade um, from an area just south of Dubois, Wyoming. Just as an example, um, the green polygons are landslides that are in our existing landslide database. So again, these were photogeologically mapped um, back in the 90s. And then the um, kind of thick red lines are the landslides that, that I've mapped in this small area uh, based on LIDAR. So um, you can see there's, there's, there's some differences. Um, and this is an area with a lot of differences because most of this um, that you see on the image here is covered in trees. So um, it would have been difficult for those mappers uh, back in the 90s to, to see everything. But there's cases where there's, um, we're identifying landslides that were not previously mapped. There's cases where we're um, adjusting borders and contacts a little bit. And then there's cases where um, there was a landslide mapped um, from, the, from the air photos that isn't necessarily being borne out in the LIDAR. So um, this will be uh, really a, a, a piecemeal effort that is, that is ongoing over many years. Um, we don't plan to have kind of a concentrated blitz of landslide mapping um, like was done in the 1990s. 
Okay, I, I want to talk a little bit now um, about some of the, the challenges that, that we face in Wyoming with um, our landslide uh, hazards program um, in, in general, uh, landslides in general. Um, and uh, one of the unique factors in Wyoming is that uh, we have a very low population density and most of the population centers are in um, the basins throughout the state. So this is a, this is a, a map of the state um, just with a hillshade base. These transparent purple areas um, show areas where the land is managed by uh, the National Park Service or the US Forest Service. So this is uh, essentially, you can think of it as public land where um, people don't live. And then um, this color ramp from yellow to, to red and pink here, this is showing population density by census block in, in people per square kilometer. So the, the yellow colors have a lower population density and then the reds and pinks uh, have a higher population density. And if we overlay the mapped landslides on this, so um, that's these uh, bright green polygons. Um, I'll do that one more time. Um, one, one thing that, that you can see is that there's, there's actually not a lot of intersection between where the landslides are and where the people live. Um, so most of these landslides are occurring in kind of the remote mountainous areas in the western part of the state. And from a, a societal perspective, that's, that's a great thing. Um, there's there's um, relatively low landslide risk compared to other parts of the country um, in Wyoming. From a scientific perspective, it, it, is, it is actually a challenge for us um, because it, it makes it difficult to study and track uh, landslides, especially active landslides that are um, you know, occurring in the present day. Um, and this also makes public awareness of landslide hazard fairly low in Wyoming. So these are, these are sort of headwinds that, that we're presented with here at the, at the survey for informing and, and protecting the public from, from hazards. And I think a, a great example of this is um, the Willow Creek landslide, which occurred in 2017. Um, this was an earth flow uh, that occurred in the Wyoming range in, in the western part of the state. So uh, I'm going to be showing a lot of images with this kind of index map. And the white star is, is the approximate location of, of where I'm talking about on, on that particular slide. But um, this, this earth flow uh, was south of Jackson and east of the, the town Alpine in, in kind of a re remote mountainous area. And it occurred sometime in May of, of 2017. And it impounded a fairly sizable lake along Willow Creek uh, behind it. And you can see that lake in this photo. And this is a, a color infrared um, aerial image uh, taken from June of that year that shows kind of the fresh uh, earth flow track and deposit, as well as the impounded lake behind it. And this earth flow uh, was not recognized until several months later in the summer um, when a uh, Forest Service um, fire reconnaissance flight actually uh, flew over this area and the, um, the pilot recognized that something was different in Willow Creek. Um, and this, uh, it, 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 didn't, it didn't end up being problematic, but this is an example of, of an event that we would like to know about um, at, the, at the State Geological Survey because Willow Creek is a, a direct tributary of the Hoback River, which is kind of just north off of this image. And there are uh, ranches and houses um, just downstream of the confluence with Willow Creek that are built along the floodplain of the Hoback River. So um, if, if, this, if this landslide dam had, a, had sort of catastrophically failed, there could have been flooding downstream. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, this is, this is an example of, of some of the, the challenges with um, these landslides occurring in, in remote areas um, and it being difficult to find out information um, about them. Another challenge that we face, which is certainly not unique uh, to Wyoming, um, it's, it's likely present in, in um, all Western states and, and throughout most of the country, is the fact that when landslides do occur in the front country, um, the, the, the assets that are typically damaged are transportation corridors and infrastructure. Um, we have in Wyoming some, some transportation corridors that are particularly problematic um, when it comes to slope stability issues. The state Transportation Department, um, which I'll refer to as YDOT. They have around 250 locations throughout the state where they monitor um, locations where their highways cross active landslides. 
And I should also mention that, that YDOT um, has their own team of geologists um, that are typically on site. So, you know, when an event like this happens, it's, it's usually not us at the State Geological Survey who is, who is directly responding to this event. Um, instead, YDOT will send their team of geologists out. But we work in, in close collaboration and, and keep in communication with, with those folks um, as, as they're responding to events. And then also as we're mapping in, in areas that are um, crossed by, by highways that, that they oversee. And so one of these transportation corridors that is especially problematic is the Wind River Canyon, which is in the central part of the state. Um, and uh, in Wind River Canyon, uh, there's a highway on one side of the river, a railroad line on the other side of the river. And this highway is the only paved road connecting the Bighorn Basin, um, which includes the towns of Cody, Thermopolis, Worland, um, the only paved road connecting that part of the state with anywhere in the southern part of the state. Um, so it's, it's really a, a critical um, uh, transportation corridor. And it seems we hear about um, rock falls or debris flows that occur in Wind River Canyon pretty much every spring. So this photo on the upper left, this is of a, um, a large debris flow that occurred in 2015. Um, this was just one of, of uh, kind of a string of events up and down the highway that occurred uh, that spring and, and had this road closed for about three days. Uh, this photo in the upper right is of a, uh, of a series of rock falls that occurred in 2017. This one uh, here mostly impacted the shoulder. And then this photo in the lower right is um, of a rock fall that occurred just this past May in one of the narrowest parts of the canyon, actually just uh, beyond a, a tunnel actually. And this particular rock fall did gain um, quite a bit of publicity in, in, the, in the news, uh, mostly because there was sort of a, a value at risk situation of, of a school bus that was basically passing by this near minutes after this landslide happened. Um, and you can see that, that school bus trying to kind of sneak around the, the rock fall here. And there was, there was um, some sort of debriefing by the transportation department about, um, about not entering an active rock fall, fall zone minutes after it had occurred. But um, anyway, this is uh, Wind River Canyon is, is one of these locations. Another location that, that we have problems with in, in Wyoming um, with, with landslides is the Togedy Pass corridor, which um, is the route of a uh, US highway that goes between the towns of Dubois and Moran. And um, this highway provides the only year round access to Jackson Hole from the east. And it's also a major gateway route for tourist traffic um, traveling to and from Grand Teton and Yellowstone National Parks in the summer. And this highway has um, historically been impacted by earth flows, debris flows, and large slumps uh, throughout the decades. This upper left photo shows an active earth flow um, right here that, is, uh, uh, that the highway is, is built over uh, in a section called Rosie's Ridge where there's uh, literally dozens of earth flows along this stretch. Uh, to the right here, this is an oblique uh, LIDAR hillshade image that's kind of looking um, down into the north a little bit, uh, but it shows a, um, an active slump flow complex that the highway crosses and uh, the highway department has had to do some regrading here um, to, um, to, to keep this area stable and has actually, as part of this regraded area, has built a, a snowmobile parking lot, which I'm pointing at there. Um, and uh, largely because of this landslide um, issue along the, the Togedy Pass corridor, um, the highway department did a, a, a major um, reroute and reconstruction effort um, from 2006 to 2013 along Togedy Pass. And as part of that, they did uh, 17 landslide stabilizations. These are some pictures of those stabilizations. In some cases, like is shown here, uh, they actually inserted these, these large styrofoam blocks um, beneath and, and sort of outboard of the road grade to promote stability. And then in other cases, they did major regrading of the slopes that were above the highway, which is what this is showing. Okay, I also, I also wanna talk about um, some uh, of the landslide, notable landslide events that have occurred in uh, Wyoming's past. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention the lower Grovant slide. Um, 
which uh, many of you I'm, I'm sure are familiar with. This is probably the most famous landslide in Wyoming's history. Um, so this was a, a translational rock slide that occurred in, in June of 1925. Um, so we're approaching the centennial in a few years here. And it involved uh, 40 million cubic meters of material, really just an, an enormous landslide. And I think the Lower Grovant slide is instructive uh, for the types of landslides and their um, sort of causative factors that we see in this part of the state, because it really does check all of the boxes of kind of the pre-existing factors that, um, that promote slope instability. So, um, you know, that, that checklist includes there being substantial um, topographic relief in this area. It's about 650 meters vertical from the, the, the top of the head scarp here to the valley floor. Um, in the Grovant Valley here, we have many hill slopes that have slope parallel bedding. So these uh, kind of forested hill slopes you see here, which are, are north facing, um, are, are actually dip slopes formed by the, the Paleozoic section of bedrock. And in this particular case, we have a um, sort of a competent and permeable sandstone. It's known as the ten sleep sandstone. And right underneath it is an impermeable um, shale rich weak formation uh, known as the Amston formation. So it was really the classic, um, the classic kind of juxtaposition of, of competence and permeability along this slope. In addition, uh, prior to the, the, the slide occurring, the Grovant River had undercut the toe of that dip slope as it had sort of been deflected to the south into the hillside. And then additionally, this slope was the site of uh, pre some prehistoric landslide complexes that the early geologists and even the locals in the area um, recognized prior to 1925. And the fact that, th that this was a, a site of, of pre-existing landslides, um, later analyses have suggested that this really was the key uh, to the failure mechanism for the lower Grovant slide. And then as far as triggers, this event also checks the requisite boxes. So um, 1925 was a, was a relatively heavy uh, snowpack year. There was abundant rain um, in the days leading up to the event. So um, there were saturated soil conditions. And then to top it all off, um, locals in, in the valley reported uh, several earthquakes in the months leading up to the event, uh, including an earthquake that's been estimated to be uh, a magnitude three or four that occurred 20 hours prior to the landslide. So all of that is to say that the lower Grovant slide really does kind of check your, your, your laundry list of, of um, factors that contribute to a large mass movement event. So when this occurred, um, the, the toe of the debris uh, dammed the Grovant River, impounding a, a lake upstream, which is known as Lower Slide Lake. And that debris also flowed several hundred meters up the opposing slope, um, the south facing slope. So really, really impressive. This is a historic photo taken a few days after the slide as the lake waters were rising um, and inundating some houses. And this is what it looks like today. Um, most of the, the actual slide mass has, has been um, revegetated by conifers, but some of these lateral scarps and the head scarp um, are, are still bare here. And so this kind of yellow tan rock, that is the 10 sleep sandstone, which was, which was the material that translationally slid down the slope. And then unfortunately, two years later, um, in the spring of 1927, um, during peak runoff, the uh, lower slide lake overtopped the landslide dam and partially drained um, catastrophically. So unleashing um, a, a flood that swept downstream, it destroyed the, the small community of Kelly a few miles downstream and unfortunately resulted in, in six deaths. Another uh, kind of landslide case study that I want to bring up, um, partially because it's, it's occurred more recently in the, in the last 15 years, is the Crystal Creek landslide. This is in the same region of the state, um, in the Grovant River watershed here in the west. Um, it's it's uh, just upstream and up a tributary drainage from the lower Grovant slide that I just talked about. And um, this is a rock slide rock fall complex that's um, experienced multiple episodes of activity in recent years. So in, in 2007 here, the, the north face of, of Crystal Peak here failed 
and uh, fell into the valley floor. This is about 700 meters vertical between the, the ridge top and the valley bottom. And then there were additional movements in subsequent years, including a debris flow in 2012 that substantially reworked the rock slide deposit. So it, it evacuated a whole bunch of material. You can kind of see the, that kind of erosional cut up here, um, also up here in this kind of lower image. And it deposited a big debris fan at the base, which is where this photo is taken, kind of looking up at the rockfall debris in the, in the head scarp. And so that um, uh, debris fan actually impounded Crystal Creek and created a new lake upstream, which uh, is kind of just through the trees um, in the right side of this image here. And this landslide um, reactivated a pre-existing landslide. Um, it was much smaller, but there, but there was a, a pre-existing landslide on this slope. Um, and interestingly, it, it involved the exact same combination of units that were involved with the lower Grovant slide. So again, that's the 10 sleep sandstone, which is this yellow tan um, layer that you can see in the head scarp and the Amston formation, which is uh, more of a, a reddish um, shaley unit. And you can see some of that reworked Amston formation kind of in this evacuation erosional uh, scarp here. And so the Crystal Creek landslide is in a wilderness area. It's about five miles upstream from a trailhead. So there weren't really any human impacts uh, from this event, um, other than that uh, the trail is a bit more popular now for folks to um, hike and check it out. Um, which I'd encourage doing if you're ever in the area. It's a, it's a really beautiful day hike. Um, and this is a really impressive uh, feature as well. Another landslide that's occurred um, in the past 15 years that has had a major economic impact um, is the double draw landslide, um, which uh, occurred in 2011. It was, this was a, a slow moving um, debris flow um, that occurred in the Snake River Canyon between the towns of uh, Jackson and Alpine, again here in Western Wyoming. And so um, this, uh, there's a US highway that, that follows the Snake River through this canyon. And this highway is an important um, commuter route for, for folks who live in the Star Valley area in the far Western part of Wyoming and commute up uh, to Jackson about an hour each way um, to work in, in Jackson for, um, Jackson's a sort of a resort community. It's a gateway to Grand Teton National Park. So there's a lot of jobs there. Um, and so this, this had a substantial impact. Um, the sort of the geologic setting here is, is, is fairly familiar for the landslides that we deal with in this part of the state in that um, it occurred in steeply dipping Cretaceous uh, bedrock units. So this upper road cut here is showing the Bear River formation. This is a, it's, it's composed of these black shale beds with some sandstone inner beds. And then this road cut on the right is showing the upper Gannet group, which is primarily limestones with some shale inner beds. Um, and and uh, kind of up and to the right of this photo is, is sort of where that debris flow initiated. It, it was indeed along one of these dip slopes. And um, it produced a, a, 10, a 10 meter thick pile of debris that covered about 100 meters uh, lengthwise along the road. Um, and it also constricted the Snake River during peak runoff, uh, as you can see with the, the toe of the debris fan here creating a, a new rapid. And a contributing factor here was absolutely saturated soil conditions. So uh, 2011 was, was a, a great heavy snow year. Um, and uh, in, the, in the week preceding this event, the immediate watershed had a, had a snowpack that was 171% of median. Um, and in, in addition, there were high temperatures recorded in the days before this event. So there was, there was rapid melting um, really priming the system there. And um, there's, a, there's an uh, interesting time-lapse video of this that I wanna show. Um, so I'm gonna go over to that now. So this is a, a time-lapse that was um, captured by uh, the transportation department. And, and sorry, it is a little grainy, but you can see here, this is the, this slow moving debris flow moving from right to left. Here's the highway, here's the river. And this time lapse was captured over a span of about 30 minutes. And um, uh, you see a, a geologist here um, for scale, who's also taking sort of a, a slow motion conveyor belt ride through this debris. The other thing that you notice is that sort of the central mass of this debris was moving faster 
than the margins. And that ended up being key for how uh, YDOT responded to this particular event. And so the rates of, of speed of this that, uh, that the um, geologists at YDOT measured uh, were somewhere in the, in the realm of um, one to two feet uh, per minute. And, and that, um, that kind of slow moving debris flow actually occurred just like that that you see in the, um, the time lapse for a, about a week's time. And, and this ended up being quite problematic again, because it disrupted this commuter traffic along this um, major, major thoroughfare here. And um, um, YDOT, because of that, they had, to, they had to wait about a week before they even started cleanup and mitigation efforts. And they really faced a lot of public pressure to act sooner. Um, but, uh, you know, there was, there was really nothing they could do while that debris um, kept, kept coming down. Um, so this event ended up closing this highway for two weeks, and it forced commuters from Star Valley um, to do a, a 75 mile detour. And I'm kind of showing where the, this is on the map here around through Idaho, up and over two mountain passes uh, into, into Jackson. And for perspective, uh, the amount of commuters that, that make this drive every day equates to about 5,500 vehicles a day having to make that two, week tri uh, two way trip. So um, it, it was a, a major impact. In addition, this disrupted a lot of local businesses, uh, tourism focused businesses. There's a fair number of commercial raft companies that run day trips along the Snake River here. And they depend on being able to run those, those day trips at, at peak runoff when the rapids are, are biggest. And so they had to delay uh, their season openings um, significantly because of this. And then a final landslide that I want to talk about here in Wyoming is uh, undoubtedly the most high profile event that has occurred um, in our state in, in the past few decades. And this is the Budge Drive landslide, which occurred in 2014. Um, this was a, a slow moving translational landslide that occurred within the town limits of Jackson. So again, this is uh, Jackson is, is kind of a um, resort tourism based community. Um, at the, the gateway to Grand Teton National Park. And this is a, a drone photo of that landslide. The head scarp is, is kind of curving around as you can see here and it cuts right through a house. Um, and then the slide mass is, is uh, you can see kind of more towards the left here. The toe is seen here with this buckling asphalt uh, that's in a parking lot for some commercial businesses. And it approached um, Broadway Avenue, which is uh, the sort of the main thoroughfare through town. Um, so this was kind of uh, absolutely in a, in a zone where it affected uh, the community. Um, this, this landslide was first detected in late 2011 um, as sort of a creeping um, slope creep issue, but it started moving in earnest in the spring of, of 2014. And the, the material that it occurred in was, was mostly unconsolidated uh, colluvium, alluvium, and some older landslide deposits that are at the base of a um, sort of a, a, a large hill up here, which is called East Grovant Butte, which is kind of above and to the right of where this photo was taken. And the failure plane was determined to be a clay layer that was about 40, uh, 40 meters deep, um, which may have actually been a, a quaternary glaso um, lacustrine sediment. And um, the potential contributing factors in, in this landslide uh, the kind of the biggest contributing factor certainly was the fact that the toe of, of this slope at the, the base of East Grovant Butte had been uh, multiple times over the years excavated and cut back. Um, this was the site of a rock quarry that was active in the 60s and 70s. Um, and additional material was removed and that cut slope was extended farther back in, in both 2003 and 2011 to make way for some of these uh, businesses at the base. And so this, this photo on the right here, um, well, you can see the toe of the landslide kind of buckling up the asphalt here right behind uh, this building. And then in the, in the background here, this cut slope is actually not part of the landslide. This is kind of one of the original quarry walls, um, but just to the left of it um, is where the, um, the material has been mobilized and incorporated into that active landslide. And then this lower photo here is, is showing uh, kind of from a similar location, again, some of this pavement buckling up near the toe of the slide. 
and um, some of these temporary retaining walls that they had to install um, along Budge Drive. And um, the, the impacts of, of this landslide were, uh, were quite significant. Um, obviously, I, I showed the, the first photo and in this photo shows it well. There was a several meter tall head scarp that cut right through a house. This house had to be um, condemned. The commercial property below was the site of a, a Walgreens that had just been built. And so that Walgreens also had to be torn down. And um, between the, the folks who had to evacuate this neighborhood up here and the employees of this Walgreens um, who, who suddenly didn't have a job, um, there were over 100 residents of Jackson who were um, directly affected by this landslide. And I should mention that this, this photo here, as well as the cross section um, here are, are from Landslide Technology, who is the contractor hired by the town of Jackson to do the geotechnical evaluation for um, this, this landslide. And then I just wanna finish up um, here with uh, uh, just some conclusions. So um, in Wyoming, we, we really do have a wide spectrum of uh, landslide hazard and landslide severity. And that's because um, within our state, we, we do have diverse topography, geologic structure and, and climate um, that, that really control the landslide hazard. So, you know, in some areas in the interior of basins, we, we really have very little landslide hazard. While in other areas in the Northwest Mountains, we, we have some of the highest mapped landslide densities in the nation. Some of our existing products, again, that are, are, are probably most useful for the public and, and researchers like yourself are um, our statewide digital landslide database, um, which can be accessed through our online geologic hazards map, as well as our one to 500,000 scale uh, statewide landslide susceptibility map. And so in the immediate future, our, our work here is gonna focus on um, producing some larger scale landslide susceptibility maps um, by county or, or 30 by 60 minute quadrangle. So if you have uh, any questions after this presentation or, or wanna get in touch, please feel free. My, I've included my email here at the bottom. Um, I'm always eager to connect with folks who are working in our region um, and who are tackling similar projects in other regions. So um, would, would love to, to get in touch with some of you out there. Um, but with that, I think I'll wrap up um, and uh, Matt, I'll be happy to, to take questions.